Welcome back to the Dare to Dream podcast. This is episode number 55, and my name is Gregory Russell Benedict. And I am Vincent Van Patten. And this is a podcast about what might be and who you could become when you have the courage to follow your dreams. And today we have the pleasure of sitting down with Eileen Davidson, who is an American actress, author, television personality, and former model. Davidson is best known for her soap opera roles on Days of Our Lives, The Young, The Restless, and The Bold and The Beautiful. Eileen is a two-time Daytime Emmy award-winning actress for outstanding lead role in a drama series. She's also a published author, writing her first novel in 2008 with three follow-up sequels. You may know her as the dark horse on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills or from <laughs> any of the above roles, but I know her as my stepmom who makes the best chocolate chip cookies in the world. <laughs> Welcome to the program. Thank you. I think I'm blushing. What does that uh, mean, dark horse? It means, <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. It's uh, the one that everybody liked that, you know, you kind of took it all by storm. Oh, I guess that's one you. way to put it. I, I think I, I made it out of there fairly unscathed. Fairly unscathed. Well, we're just, you know, just want to hear about the whole story, how you got started. Um, oh you've told God. me, you know, through... Throughout my life, just when you were my age and getting your whole career going, and that's what we're really interested in when you okay. start to dare to dream. And I think I wanted to start it with something we were talking about over Christmas, which is a Tom Petty quote, um, do something you really like, and hopefully it pays the rent. As far as I'm concerned, that's success. I love that quote. It's a great quote. So we use that as a jumping off point. What does that, how does that maybe relate to your uh, beginning of your career and Gosh, I kind of got started. You know, it still seems like a magical mystery tour to me because I mean, I never acted when I was in school. I was too shy. And so um, I was always like the, the kid that kind of knew the answer to questions that were asked, but was afraid to raise my hand for fear of being wrong and being embarrassed. So I didn't try to do things when I was growing up that I wanted to do because I was afraid of failing. Um, but something happened to me when I got a little bit older. Um, I was going to Orange Coast College and I was majoring in journalism um, with a photography minor. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was just kind of trying to get credits. I'd gotten accepted into some colleges, but I didn't want to. Most everybody I knew was partying in, in college. And I, not that I didn't party, I certainly did my fair share, but I kind of just wanted to get on with my life. So I, I took off for Hawaii for a couple of weeks. My girlfriend had moved there. And I ended up on the North Shore with no phone, no television, no car to try to figure things out. I was um, 19 and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I just, um, I had done a little bit of modeling in Orange County where I'd gone to school. And I thought, you know, I'm just gonna, I decided after, I, I was there for two weeks and I ended up staying for two months um, trying to figure things out. And I ended up um, just deciding on that trip, I'm gonna give it a shot. And I had a feeling, I found, I think I told you that too, honey, that I found um, something I'd written down around that time that I was gonna, I had no safety net, no boyfriend, no job, no nothing. And I figure, you know what? I'm just going to go to Hollywood. I have a feeling, you know? And so I ended up moving up there and um, went to acting school because my roommate, a guy roommate, and I had a girl roommate and the, they were actors. And they said, you should take um, an acting class just to loosen up for modeling. So I started taking an acting class and I fell in love. And then I just really committed to it. I just decided, you know what? I'm just gonna give this everything I've got. And at that point, it was more like, um, I was more afraid of not trying. I, I hated to think about being 50 years old and looking back and regretting not trying. So that was my, my biggest impetus was, um, it changed from the fear of failure to the biggest fear was um, looking back at my life and saying, why hadn't I just tried? At least, you know, you know, you're not always gonna be successful at everything you do for sure, but I'd rather look back and know that I tried and then it didn't work out. So it wasn't for me, it wasn't my path than not having tried at all. And that was like a, a big fire for me. It really lit me on fire. And I started working a lot, um, I did like, I had three jobs. I worked for my father. I was a waitress. I worked at a recording company as the receptionist. I worked at the acting school to pay for my acting classes. I was cleaning the bathroom. Wow. Because <laughs> they would give me like an extra class a month if I, if I cleaned the bathroom. So I did that. 
And I mean, I started working a year and a half later. It was insane. And I stopped my day jobs and just supported myself as an actress from around 22 on. It was crazy. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> That's why I look back on it. I'm like, how did this even happen? Because I, I, you know, who knows? I, I guess it's part of it is destiny. And it's also just um, following your hunches, going with your gut and um, being more afraid of regret than failure. Yeah. Well, Eileen, you are speaking my language. That, yeah? part, where, that <laughs> part where you talked about the fear of failure being outweighed by the fear of waking up when you're older and realizing that you never did it and having that regret, that's what motivated me to leave my job in finance. And that just, I really relate to that. I want to dig in a little bit more to that, that feeling you had. You said you just had a feeling things were going to work out. What was that like? Gosh, you know what? I wish I could say that I just knew. I, I didn't. I was scared. I mean, I really, really was scared. I didn't have a, a tons of self-esteem. Um, it was more like, like I said, it was just, it was not being sure that it was going to work out. It was just being sure that I had to try. That's really, because I don't, I don't have great self-confidence, believe it or not, I still don't, but I have more, um, I have more confidence in the fact that um, my ability to, to survive things, even if I fail, I have failed at a lot of things and they've been embarrassing, but um, I will still keep trying because to me, it's more important to keep trying to keep learning than it is to fail. Did that answer your question? I'm not sure. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. I think we're both, I just read this book, Mastery by Robert Greene. He's reading it right now and it's one of the best books I've ever read and talks about in your twenties, how you should just be trying as many things as you can that align with some of your innate interests. So if you, I was going to ask you, did you have, like when you were a kid, what sort of interest um, do you still kind of cultivate now? And how did that kind of lead you to take that first step? Interesting. Um, well, I used to, I used to, well, I still have horrible insomnia and I used to, as a kid have horrible insomnia. And what I did is I read, I mean, I, I was so well read. I read, 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 but I also was, I painted. Mm -hmm. So I was constantly painting and drawing and from a very, very early age on. And I mean, I still do that. That's one of the paintings I did a few years ago. And I, this, my office is full of different things that I've painted and I still, you know, I wouldn't say I'm the best artist in the world, but I really enjoy it. And I've actually become a little bit more, um, I when I, funny because of COVID, I was doing more of these Zoom things and people would see my art in the background and go, oh my God, that's really cool. I'm like, oh, well, thank you. So again, it's like something I was kind of like, not super thrilled about, but realizing it, you know, it's my, I have a definite style and mm -hmm. maybe if I embraced it more at this point in my life, I could actually get better instead of judging it so much. Um, also, I took piano lessons when I was a little girl. And um, because of COVID, I've gotten back. I mean, I, pr I played off and on in my adult life, but definitely in the last year or so, I've gotten, um, I've recommitted to that. And I started taking guitar a few years ago. I'm always trying to do things. Um, I just, I just, I'm excited about learning new things, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, art or whatever. I just really enjoy it. And languages, I've always taken languages. Um, I was speaking, I was learning French a few years ago. Then I, I learned Italian. Remember we went to Italy and I was actually oh, yeah. conversing with the taxi driver? <laughs> you wouldn't stop. <laughs> you wouldn't stop. <laughs> no, it's, a, uh, it's a great point though, because I think like just as young people, we're looking for like the first step of our career. And that might, we might just think that like, I have to put aside my childhood curiosity or just the things that make me happy. And this kind of relates to the Tom Petty quote, like I'm, we both are, you know, we're surviving, doing enough to pay the rent, but we're actually, you know, trying to find the things that really just, that we're excited to be doing. And that's creating art and that's just being creative. And I was just thinking, you know, I've had my dad, my mom, you Duke on this podcast, which how lucky I am to have creative people just surrounding me and how grateful I am for that. It's honestly unbelievable and obviously it comes from family history and everything but it is just to be surrounded by creativity and to see that that and like the humanities you know reading and that stuff is just as important as like a career and finding like what's going to make you money maybe well, more yeah. important. I think it is more important actually um yeah and also I mean I kind of believe that our souls are, are heat seeking missiles so our souls are going to find those groups of people you know, we're, we're like put here for a reason. 
to kind of help each other grow, um, whether it's in a positive way or even a negative way. I think that we're all working together to become, you know, better, higher consciousness. That's my personal opinion. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's no accident that you landed in this family and you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And it's crazy that, you know, it, that when you're in the moment, it's, it's hard to see, like hard to zoom out and see that this is what I'm supposed to be doing right now. Even if it's just being, you know, waddling around, I don't know if that's a word, but just in the uncertainty of like, what else I can be doing? Am I, have I, am I doing enough? All mm -hmm. that. So how did you, I guess, when you were kind of our age, get over, well, you were successful pretty early on. So it kind of gave you the confidence, I assume, to continue going, but just getting over the resistance, because that's, that's one of the hardest things. Interesting story here. See, I mean, we're all still works in progress, no matter what kind of success we've had or, or how old we are. Mm -hmm. But when I, I left The Young and the Restless when I was 28. Um, because I just wanted to do something else. I was on the show. I'd done a couple of movies of the week while I was on Young and Restless and I'd done movies before that. But I was 28 and I was like, you know, I don't want to spend my entire life doing, again, I was in the same position. What about what if? What if I started doing other things? Do I really want to do this the rest of my life? And the answer was no. So I left the show and I had a mortgage and a Porsche <laughs> and not a lot of money in the bank. So that was not fun. I started like painting shoes and my mom was like, well, you could like maybe sell, sell them at the swap meet. I'm like, I'm not a complete failure quite yet. <laughs> I'm gonna stick with the acting for a little while longer, mom. But um, so I ended up um, kind of having a mini nervous breakdown because even though I thought that I would go out there and try to figure it out, I really didn't know. I hadn't realized how much I had identified with being a celebrity and the, um, the cushy lifestyle and the recognition and everything that that entails. And then all of a sudden, when I'd cut myself off from it, I was like, oh, who am I? And I ended up freezing. I didn't want to audition. It was terrifying to me. I felt like, haven't I proven myself the last six years? I've been working and blah, blah, blah. And then I became too, um, too aware of myself. So I couldn't really audition because then mm -hmm. I felt like completely judged. And that was like a game changer. I couldn't even move. So I, my agent lost faith in me because I didn't want to audition. And interestingly enough, I started getting involved in charity work. I'd been dating somebody who was very, very heavily into charity work. Wow. And through his influence, I started um, um, going down to Para Los Niños, which is an organization in downtown LA that deals with underprivileged kids. It's a daycare. And I went in with as not a celebrity. I just started volunteering there. And I started helping out the kids. And then I started taking the Chuck E. Cheese and then I got vans donated. I started calling and celebrity. That became like a really big passion. And it changed my life from just looking outside of I me, mean, just looking into myself. It was always about me, me, me as an actor. What am I gonna do? How am I gonna succeed? What about me? What about me? I used to joke around about it. What about me? It's always about me. And I started um, looking outside of my life and trying to see people that were in worse circumstances, what I could bring to the table instead of what I can take from the table. Mm -hmm. And that was a life changer because um, it put me on a completely different path where, um, I mean, I'm still doing it today. I'm involved with Project Angel Food. I'm involved with No Kid Hungry. I had, you know, remember Paul, we had a foster child. I used to, to be a special friend to a foster child for many, many, many years. And that gave me something in my life that I hadn't really had before. My mom was always um, really big about giving back. I was raised that way. But I think when you're in your teens and your 20s, you're really focused on yourself and trying to find out what works for you. And um, by this time, I was nearing 30. And it was more like, well, what am I here? What can I offer the world? And without even understanding it, it gave me so much more than I ever anticipated. What I ever ended up giving was what I started getting. And I think it made me a more, more well-rounded person. And interestingly enough, probably a better actor and definitely a better person. And um, what happened for me is that I, I started, I settled down, I became less self-involved. I decided I got a series. I, I ended up auditioning and getting more work. And um, it's just, a, it's a progression. You know, everything in life is a progression. Um, but I did have that nasty little um, midlife crisis at 30. <laughs> it wasn't fun. I was by the pool a lot, like going, what am I doing here? You know, what's the point? And I didn't have a lot of money and it was kind of scary. 
I think Vinny and I have each had six or seven of those in the past two years. Three a week. I consider you lucky. You should be wandering around, not sure of what you're doing. You have to be, you have to be in the not knowing before you can know anything. You have to be. Mm -hmm. If you think you know everything, then there's nothing, there's nothing available. There's no bandwidth for you to take in new experiences and new knowledge, right? Absolutely. And there's, you know, I want to get into just the uh, the topic of giving back and um kind of taking that viewpoint of it but i also this relates to the poem that you read on christmas t.s Eliot, and it relates perfectly so i'm going to read it i said to my soul be still and wait without hope for hope would be hope for the wrong thing wait without love for love would be love of the wrong thing there is yet faith but the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting wait without thought for you are not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be the light and the stillness, the dancing. Whisper of running streams and winter lightning. The wild theme unseen in the wild strawberry. The laughter in the garden echoed ecstasy. Not lost, but requiring. Point to the agony of death and birth. Shall I say it again? In order to arrive there, to arrive where you are, to get from where you are not, you must go by a way wherein there is no ecstasy. In order to arrive at where you do not know, you must go by a way which is the way of ignorance. In order to possess what you do not possess, you must go by the way of dispossession. In order to arrive at what you are not, you must go through the way in which you are not. And what you do not know is the only thing you know. And what you own is what you do not own. And where you are, is where you are not. So fantastic, isn't it? That's isn't it? I told you I gave you that book for Christmas, right? And it was the I've had that book for a long, long time since I was probably in my twenties and thirties, and I had put quotes around that passage, mm -hmm. which I, I don't know what I was going through in my life that I could possibly have been that smart that young. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> it's pretty amazing that. The only way to grow, to get where you're supposed to go is by assuming the role of the fool who wanders around the darkness, but at least you care enough that you want to explore and ins not ins inspect the world, I guess. Just be curious. And, and I think that relates to just like, you know, getting back to what you like to do as a kid and really ask yourself those questions too of like, what do I genuinely, genuinely enjoy and kind of going from there and not feeling like you have to know the answers. I think that's been a huge lesson for us is just being okay with the, the mystery. Well, really it's, like, it's actually, like it's getting comfortable with not knowing. And that's really difficult for most people, you know, because we all want to have some control and some kind of a, be able to predict what's going to happen in our lives. But strangely enough, I found myself back in that same situation a couple of years ago when I left the young, the restless again, <laughs> I broke with my boyfriend again. Um, and, and that was, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult when you are, you know, now we've got a mortgage and we've got kids and, you know, life is much different than it was when I was 20, uh, 28 leaving. Um, but I just knew I had to, I, and I didn't, it wasn't like people are going, oh, you want to go do nighttime? I'm like, not really. I go, I, I want to work less. I just want to be more present. And um, it's kind of scary because uh, I think I told you this and I've told other people, I mean, we're not independently wealthy. We need to work to support our lifestyle. Um, but I knew that I had to leave that comfortable job and I needed to leave that security. And, I, and also what I found that I'm enjoying so much, especially because of COVID and everything else is painting, taking guitar lessons, piano lessons again, uh, it's scary. Um, there's, 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 uh, I told your dad this when I, when I left, I go, honey, I think I really want to quit my job. Can you support me in this? Your dad's always been great about that kind of stuff. He's like, yeah, if you need to, but I mean, it's gotta be scary for him too. So thank <laughs> God for him, um, that he's willing to step off with me and, and, and we're able to just kind of walk into the unknown about what this all is. And I'm still in it. I'm, I'm still don't know. I mean, YNR has been great enough to say, we'll work when you want to work will work you when you want to work. Thank you. I, I mean, I never could have predicted that at all, ever in a million years. I thought they were going to recast. But um, I st still am dealing with the unknown. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not done. 
but I don't know what my career looks like. I don't know if I still will have a career. Um, and I am just trying to get comfortable with not knowing, mm. you know? Yeah. How is the texture or the essence of being in the unknown different this time than it was back in your late 20s, early 30s? Gosh, that's a really super good question. It's so different in so many ways, and yet it's it's the same. Um, well, then I had no cushion. I had got I had bought a house and, I, and an expensive car, and didn't have a lot of savings. Just wasn't being super smart about my money. I mean, now we've saved we've saved I've saved a lot of money. Um, I hope I'm not getting too personal here about myself, but I mean, we'll have to we would have to move at some date, you know, in the future if I'm not working because of our overhead of where we are overhead of where I'm currently living with my husband and Jesse. So um, there's always that possibility. I will have to give up this lifestyle um, if I don't start pulling in more money in some way, but then I'm willing to do that. And so is Vinny, you know, we both know we're going to be okay. There was something really cool about that too, by the way, it's good for everybody to kind of know that if you lose everything that you identify, which I've done, it's like die, you have to die. So if you're willing for that part of you to die, Mm -hmm. um and then you can face that what is so scary and go you know what i'm going to be okay if i don't have this house if i don't have that i'm still going to be okay i'm going to be okay um i mean i'm driving a 2011 flex still because i didn't want to get a new car because i don't have income so i'm trying to be smart about it too but um what was the question <laughs> oh yeah so in that way it's different um because i didn't have a lot you know, of save of money saved at that time, but it's the same because it's it's still trying to get comfortable with the unknown. The only great thing about getting older is um, you've been through it, and you've been through a lot of different things, and you know that you survive. Mm. I love how you describe that. It makes me think of there's a author and speaker. His name is Vishen Lakhiani, and he kind of coined this phrase called the beautiful destruction that you must die, things must fall apart in order for the new you to emerge and the phoenix to rise from the ashes. And it sounds like you're okay with that and you're comfortable. And one of the main differences now is that you've been through it before and you know you're gonna be yeah. okay. You know, that's a funny thing about it though. Uh, it's like, you're not really ever comfortable with it. Yeah. And I think it's super important for people to know that it's not like um, it's a safe, comfortable feeling. And so that's why it's OK. You don't really feel comfortable with it. You're more comfortable with being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. I think, for me. Um, you know, and like I said, it's still a work in progress. Some days are better than others. You know, some days I wake up and I'm going, what have I done? And, you know, you know, uh, my identity is slipping away. <laughs> but then, you know. It's a, it's a weird thing, like, you know, kind of certain things are shutting down again because of Omicron. And um, this morning I woke up feeling like, gosh, the sands are shifting again. And it, I kind of had a weird feeling of elation. And Vinny, I asked your dad, I go, you know, it's really strange. I go, instead of feeling like fear about what's gonna happen, I almost feel like things are shifting and we're back to the unknown and it's a little exciting. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I don't want to feel like I'm some kind of a weird masochist. <laughs> and I don't, I'm not like wishing this on anybody because I know people are struggling, but the unknown it has so much potential and there's something super exciting about that. And that means that there's fears and, and all sorts of other things thrown into the same soup. Um, so it's complicated. Mm -hmm watching Seth Godin, who's this writer and uh, just marketing expert guy, um, looking at one of his books right now. One of his videos today, just about eh, like right now we are, we are creating the new normal. Like if you're expecting the world to go back to how it was, you're living in a fairy tale. Like this is, we're creating the new normal every single day. Yeah. And to be a leader is to be on the fringes of what was kind of considered, you know, normal before, but we're, it's it's anybody's ball game right now and to be i guess the the quality that is kind of gonna separate the the leaders from the non-leaders is just being okay with that unknown and being willing to step into it and continue confronting it and i just for me personally i <laughs> my life is just it seems like there's just three questions that it's just like when am i 
when's the world going to go open up so I could, you know, pursue my dream of going to Japan? When is my back? When am I even going to get answers about my body healing? And what career step am I going to take next? But like, and I thinking about my writing my, my newsletter tomorrow, like I'm writing, I just started, I started today, I just started writing about like pretty much this being okay with the unknown. Like, geez, I feel like I write about this every single week, but yeah. it's, it's just, I'm consumed by it. And I guess I am getting better at being okay with it, but it's, it's not easy. And that's what I was, I was thinking about before with the, how our lives have to pretty much crumble before we could be rebirthed. It doesn't mean it's going to be a clean and easy death and rebirth for anybody. Like when you, when you're in the dying phases, you feel like your world is falling apart and you don't know what the heck to do. Well, there's also another part of that. Um, when I left the show young and restless this time, I thought that by now I would have answers. <laughs> there's no guarantee when you're going to get your answers. Exactly. And that's all part of it. It's freaky, but it's part of it. And then comes the part where you must trust your process. At some point when you're like, I do the, have to do this, I have to come back and go, this is all happening for a reason. Every single bit of it, all of the not knowing, all of not being sure, all of the frustration, your back, everything, as I'm sure you've already put that together. Mm -hmm. But honestly, that's the biggest thing that I always need to remind myself of. There's no accidents. And this is all happening for a reason, everything. And yeah. all of the, the reasons that you're, you're, you're told to stay put, you can't move forward because you're supposed to sit in this mud a little longer. And you're supposed to trust the fact that you will know you're going to get the rock on the head and then also you're going to go, oh my God, that's what that was about. That's why I had to wait so long. Um, it's just, like I said, it's uncomfortable waiting in that place. You mm -hmm. know, this is actually a great kind of transition back to the giving um, a community and kind of taking yourself out of it. You know, I could be thinking like, I could wake up every day and be like, why, why is this happening to me? But I've started and it's kind of been a shift in my writing too. And um back to kind of just having your practice for me, it's writing. Like that's the thing that kind of gets me through the dark times, but I've had kind of had a shift to making it about other people. Like, okay, this, this isn't about me anymore. How could I put myself in the position of somebody else who's going through something much worse and like, just try to see where they're coming from and just write for that person. And I mean, Greg, him starting a nonprofit, like that was doing amazing. thing for, for others. And uh, maybe at, you know, the young stages of our lives, that's something that could be helpful of instead of uh, thinking about like, what, what do I, what's my path, what's my purpose? How can you give back? How can you uh, start relating service. to other people more? How can you be of service? And then maybe the answers will come through that. Yes, I think that's actually, like I said, it's a, it's a big point I think about in terms of becoming a total human is, is you're not here just for yourself. You're just not, you're here for the world. And um, we're all here for the world. So it's like, how can you incorporate that more into your life? Super important. And by the way, I actually wanted to, to open this whole podcast with saying how grateful I am for both of you and what you're doing with your platform and how it's just so amazing that you two are helping light the road. And I'm going to get emotional because I love you so much. And um, I think you're doing such great work and you're both in service right now by sharing this, by talking to people and um, sharing your journey and what makes you afraid and what makes you strong. And um, people realize through what you're doing that we're so much more alike than we are different. We all have the same fears. We all just wanna be loved. We all just wanna be accepted. Um, anyway, so I'm grateful to you oh, too. Thank you. We right back at you. We'd nowhere without you. Well, <laughs> Greg might, but I wouldn't be. <laughs> Right, you'd be nothing without me. Exactly. <laughs> I knew you were speaking to me when you said I love you. I saw that. We had, we had the I eye contact. To you. I do love you. Oh, I appreciate uh, that. Thank you so truly. much. And I think one, like just to kind of piggyback off of what you said, Vinny, and where we're going with this is it's really hard, I think, to start to make that transition from only focusing on you and your concerns and your issues to broadening it to how can I serve other people? Because I don't know. I'm just thinking back to when I was a teenager, just an angsty teenager. And like, everything's always about you. And then you go to college or you go to school, or maybe you don't, and you just go straight into the workforce. 
but it's always like people are asking you, what do you do? Like, where did you go to school? It's all about you. And how, how would, what would your advice be to make that transition into focusing more on service and having a heart of service? Yeah. You know, the funny thing is, is I think it has to be authentic. Um, when I was younger, because I said, like I said, my mom was really big on giving back. You know, we were always raising money because I was raised in a very Catholic home. I went to parochial school my whole life. So it was always about raising money for missions and blah, blah, blah. And she was always on me about doing something. So I started teaching dance classes when I was just moved to Hollywood to girls that um, were kind of in halfway houses. They're like 15, 16, you know, re recovering from drug addiction. But I wasn't ready to give back on that level. I was too busy trying to keep my head above water. So, I mean, I only did it for like a couple of months and then I ended up not showing up. And so I guess my point is um, I would start small, even in terms of smiling at people you don't know or engaging with them or, you know, just being available as a, one human to another just in passing, honestly, is, is like a big deal because mm -hmm. we're so, yeah. you know, insulated, insular. So, I mean, on a small level, um, other than that, I think just keep your your it see what keep your eyes and ears open to what what really sings for you in terms of giving back that can be anything. There's so many different things out there, whether it's helping the SPCA or fostering a, a cat or whatever it is, you know. And then you what yeah, what I think that kind of does is it's kind of gets a fire going and you start realizing mm -hmm. how it kind of lights your soul on fire to give back. And it's really kind of a selfish thing. That's the irony. It makes you feel so good you want to keep doing it. Isn't that interesting? The gift yeah. is to the giver. Selfless act becomes quite selfish. True. It is true. <laughs> Where should we go from here? Well, so second, let's say after your, your mini midlife crisis, how to go from there? How did you continue to battle with the resistance? And just how did your career kind of blossom from there? You know, again, it, it just feels like a series of events. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, jumping, uh, jumping onto things that presented themselves. I ended up going back to daytime. I, I left it. I did a, I did a couple feature films. I did a nighttime series. Um, I went back to daytime. It was kind of dying out. And then it wasn't a great experience when I did go back in the beginning, I went to a different show and then um, they ended up writing my character who was another good girl. Like I played in on the young and restless. They turned her bad. And for me as an actress, it was the opportunity to kind of show a part of myself I hadn't really been able to show since I was in my very early 20s when I played bad girls in movies, you know, in horror movies, I was like the evil one. Um, so then they were going to cast somebody who looked like me to play a role um, on the same show. And I said, you know what, why don't you let me play both roles? Because I thought that would be fun. And like, and they said, okay. And I ended up playing both roles and the head writer of that show, James Riley, um, crazy genius guy, just like a nut, just ended up writing five characters for me. And I played them all. And one was a man, one was a say, nut. Eddie Mer that the Nutty Professor is- uh, Yes, I literally made the television history by playing five roles at the same time. I got my first Emmy nomination. Um, I was exhausted because I literally one time had 80 pages of dialogue in one day because I was playing everybody. <laughs> it was insane but that was again kind of a thing where I just said you know um, I embraced it this opportunity and it really kind of changed my life um, it put me in a different arena I ended up leaving that show too because I just decided I wanted to do something else and I walked into the unknown again hmm. and um, again didn't work for a year um wasn't sure what I was going to do blah 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 but I, I I did a couple of things. And then the young and restless called me back after 10 years of not being on and said, would you come back for X amount of money? It was a lot of money. And I was like, you know, I could probably make this work for myself for now. And I went back and I met your father, you know, six months later. Gotcha. <laughs> how did you deal with, or how do you, how do you deal with comparison? And so what I'm, what I'm getting is, and what I've, just seen through your actions is you, you do care more about being happy than like continually having to prove yourself and rising and kind yeah. of getting more power and stuff. Was that like a, a turning point for you when you realized like, okay, I, I just, I'd rather have time to be with Jesse and create, you know, 
you know, cultivate other aspects of my life instead of having to maybe continue proving myself or. You know, I, I kind of, I've been meditating for a long, long time. I've been meditating for, I started meditating in the early nineties. I did TM. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've done a bunch of different things since then uh, with that. And I've done a lot of seminars and retreats. I followed the course of miracles. Um, I followed Marianne Williamson back in the eighties and the nineties. I was really, I was really into kind of listening to the still voice and there's a lot of noise. So it's, it's not easy to do, but I think I have kind of been able to gauge um, what really matters. And again, it doesn't mean that it's easy and it doesn't mean that it's always smooth. I just sometimes feel like I need to do this now. And I, instead of shying away from it, I listen and I don't listen right away. Sometimes I have to get hit over the head, like listen, or how about this? When I was on the Young and the Restless this, during this last time, I started getting sick to my stomach every time I went to work. Mm. Every single time. So it's like, I couldn't ignore it anymore. Mm -hmm. It was like, I had to listen. And then I, re I realized this is kind of making me physically ill. It's not what I'm supposed to be doing right now. So, yeah. so I literally just, you know, every, you know, if I tried it, if they asked me to go back for too long or whatever, I even told the writer on the show, I said, you know, I, I so appreciate this, but I get sick to my stomach. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably not the best thing you could say you, know? <laughs> you make me no, ill yeah. um, physically but, ill but it's kind of like listening to your gut and following your instincts and I also knew that um, I wanted to be more present a lot of the time you know you know Vinny when you were little I felt like you guys were living this great lifestyle and I was stuck inside a studio I was yeah. bitter I'm like they're gone at 4 30 a.m every day no. and reading lines crazy bringing crazy. my my baby into work with me it was insane but so it was more just about you know feeling like at this point in my life i need to do this it's going to pivot it's going to constantly pivot and change and you just have to kind of like now i need to be working now i need to not be working now i need to go this way so it's just you know that's my personal path um but everybody's different you know but everybody's got instincts and i suggest you listen Mm, that reminds me of the Victor Frankl passage we love to read. And he just tells like when his students ask for advice on how to be successful, it's a whole long passage about not chasing happiness and not pursuing success. Those things come as a byproduct of yeah. finding that thing that lights you up and listening to what your, your mind and your heart and your soul are telling you to do. And if you're, you're getting physically ill, obviously that's a signal. That's your body trying to tell you that this is not the right path. <laughs> Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I so, kind of find that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask a question about, so you're working extremely hard. You're waking up at 430. You're, you're playing five characters at once. That's insane. What were some of the other practices besides meditation or in addition to meditation that you use to stay grounded and centered and be able to work that hard consistently? Wow. Gosh. Making I'm brownies for us. Yeah, I don't know, you know, just uh, <sighs> reading, reading things that, you know, I, I stopped reading after I had my son, actually, because I got so busy, I, I couldn't even read anymore. But, um, and I have to say that a lot of that period, like when Vinny and, and his brother Duke were little and Jesse was a baby, I was really just kind of in survival mode. It was really about making money and providing a home and a lifestyle. Um, so everything has a time and a place. So that was kind of like my commitment then. So sometimes I would stop meditating and stop reading and I would just be doing that. And then when that would not work for me anymore, then you pull back and you do something else. Do you know what I mean? It's certainly not linear. Yeah. Um, but I would say meditation has always been the, you know, the most constant thing when it comes to, to that. And also being open to different um, different practices. You know, I've studied a lot. Like I said, I, I was also interested in self-realization. I gave you for your birthday, um, autobiography of a yogi. I read that when I was like going through my midlife crisis. Mm. I read that book at that time. Um, so, you know, it's been kind of a Deepak Chopra. I was really big on reading Deepak in the nineties. I read all of his stuff. Um, um, so was that answer your question? I guess so. I've just different, it opened up to like different teachers. You know, I think it, a lesson to take away from that and something that 
I've been thinking about, I don't know, think about a lot of things. But, um, it's, you know, finding the middle path. It's, it's never, it's not as easy as like finding the balance in life. There's always going to be some balance that you have to come back to. There's going to be times where you're all in on your work. And if that's genuinely firing you up and you know that you have to, you're excited about it and it's, it feels good, then give yourself to it. And then in the times of, in the downtimes, allowing yourself, you know, the, the peace of mind that this is okay, that I'm not working so hard. Like I can truly enjoy this, the, you know, the winter months of slumbering, like let yourself rest. And I, I'm just kind of realizing like with the book, it was like, I was all in just going ham. And then now I'm kind of just kind of thinking about different things and allowing that room to allow for other things to blossom. Yeah. So, you know, a lot, like it's, it's part of the journey. There's it's not, also part you know, of the journey is, is, is practicality, right? Sometimes you just need to fetch the wood, carry the water. Sure. Sometimes you just need to make a living. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> it's, not, it's not necessarily going to be, it's not going to be, um, following this, you know, whatever being peaceful and meditating. It's not always, sometimes you, you've got to make the dollar at that point in my life. I was, I really needed to be a money earner. And there's a lot to learn through that too. Everything is a learning experience, even though it's not necessarily, you know, think of it as at the time it's sometimes it seems like it's the antithesis of what you want to be doing, but yet you're learning from experiencing that part of the scale, that part of the pendulum. And that's exactly what you need in that moment. How are you learning these days? Um, well, um, it's the same way I've been learning for a while from you, Experience. you boys, ah. um, <laughs> people around me. Um, you know, just life experience, obviously with COVID and everything, everybody has a different reality of COVID. It's been a real journey. Um, it's so interesting because you think going through a pandemic, we're all going through a pandemic, but we're really, we're not. We're all going through a much different pandemic than the other person. <laughs> And that's yeah. been a learning experience too, you know, kind of like letting, letting people do what they need to do for themselves when you kind of want to shake them and say, what are you doing? And you got to realize you got to just like, kind of like um, love people with an open hand and everybody has to have their own experience. Um, so I'm learning from that. Um, and that kind of goes, goes for everything. I think in life, it's like learning, you know, being with people with an open hand, everybody has to learn things their own way. Um, also knowing that it's okay to let go of toxic relationships. Mm. Um, I've always been a person who thought you had to heal everything. Um, I always thought you had to be, you had to communicate with people. You had to come to a common ground. You had to understand each other. You have to. And then I've realized that, wow, you can't come to a common ground when you're coming from completely different poles, right. you know, different polarities. It's impossible. So if I'm saying this to somebody and I'm thinking they're going to understand it, but those, they're hearing this because of where they are, you're always going to be like this. So sometimes you just have to let it go. And you have to trust that letting something go is the right thing too. It's when I was on the housewives, that was kind of my thing. I was always trying to make peace with everybody. I kind of learned that from the housewives actually, that you can't, you really can't. Um, and that's okay. It's all right. You don't have to be at peace with everybody. It's impossible. It is impossible. And it, it makes you become something you're not if you're constantly trying to appease other people that just won't, you're not going to see eye to eye. And right. you, that doesn't mean you can't love them for what they are. But yeah, that's, that's a great lesson. Yeah, it's a huge lesson. Actually, I learned a lot on that show. It's the funniest thing. <laughs> I learned things that you of course. <laughs> Um, black sheep yeah, I learned a lot about like like what people will do for fame it's astounding yeah. it's astounding to me I was so naive um anyway so and I, I learned a lot about myself and and what what who I became in those kind of circumstances so it was pretty awesome did you like who you were becoming in those circumstances I liked some of it I didn't like all of it yeah. Yeah. So like certain things I was like, yeah, I'm happy that I could stand up for what I really believed in, in adverse situation. Um, but I also realized about a lot of uh, 
personal issues I had, like maybe a lot of shame or whatever, Catholic shame that I was carrying on that would oh, wow. bleed through the show. I mean, really, it was like, wow. It was like going through some kind of like a major like psychological class because it's also societal, you know, so much of it is like how society will judge you and accept you based on certain things. I found that um, part of the time I was trying to keep up with these women. I didn't have the bank account these women have. <laughs> And I didn't want to keep up with a lot of things that they that, that they were, but you find yourself competing. I'm like, I'm competing. I'm like, why am I competing? <laughs> I don't care. So it was really interesting how you can get swept up in things. And it's like a little Petri dish that I found myself in. And all of a sudden things just changed. But overall, um, I was kind of happy with how I, I dealt with things and handled situations that were clearly crazy. And I think... Being yourself in the end, you know, the great heroes of history and you get judged in hindsight, looking back on people who actually stood for something that's more important than, you know, going with what people wanted or just pursuing fame. And yeah, so oh my God. definitely, oh, yeah. I mean, I think the world learned from you for standing up for your beliefs and it's truly inspiring. <laughs> well, you know, that segues to one of our favorite questions. Nowadays, I'm sure it's changed throughout the years, but what does success mean to you? Huh. Well, you know, I love that Tom Petty quote. I know. I was going to say you could riff I, off that if you'd like. I know. I know. Um, I guess it's really true, though. You know, I guess success is never being tired, um, never being tired of learning, always being curious, uh, thinking about people. I don't know. There's so many things. There's so many things that kind of wrap up success, but um, I don't know. I think the things that really matter are just love and um, I can't answer that question. I don't I think, think I can you, answer that question. You did. You did. I just think it's about love, really. I guess that's the simplest answer, right? That's what it's all about. Success is love. I love, I love that. <laughs> And it really is right. If you're, if the polar opposite of love is fear, then, um, yeah, it's love. Cause then you'll, you'll embrace things and, and then you'll know what kind of what really matters at the end of the day, no matter what situation you're in. Yeah. So another question we love to ask is if you could go back, if you could go back to orange coast college, I might be saying that wrong and That's see right. yourself, see yourself in your, your early twenties, what, advice would you give to yourself oh god you guys <laughs> um does it sound weird that i'm still trying to give myself that advice just again not to be too hard on yourself um uh to to love yourself more and to be more forgiving i think that's advice we should be giving ourselves always and forever yeah, I, mean, I would say be more forgiving of yourself. It's all and realize do. that we are human beings and that we're not supposed to be perfect because basically we're in school and therefore we are supposed to, you know, fail some classes and succeed at others. And it's a process. It's all a process, the school of life. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Eileen, for coming on the show. We really, really appreciate it. I loved it. You guys are amazing. That was a great time. Thank, Thank you so you much. Ah. Thank you. You are as well. You have changed my life in so many ways and, you know, constant inspiration, creative, creatively and otherwise. And you're just the person who likes to have fun. My dad, I like to say, like was at Christmas, I gave you the happiness rock and him the gratitude <laughs> rock because you were, you would always push us to do fun things, get on the zip line and why my right? dad would, you know, no, no, no. So anyways, that's just the kind of person you are. And, you know, you're still, breaking boundaries creatively and just finding what lights your soul on fire. So yeah. keep doing you. We Enjoy love your you guys. Life. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really excited to watch your next adventure and to see what God. you're doing. It could be nothing. Or it could be great. <laughs> the next adventure of all. Could be something. <laughs> could be. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for tuning in with us today. As always, we are grateful and we love you guys. Love y'all. Guys, love Bye you. Now.